think naturally I'm just have a really good fresher kick and kick in general. Like even when I think back to like training at home in Ireland, like I used to love kick sets and felt like I just have really good endurance for kicking um, and just always had a good breaststroke kick. Probably ask my club coach and she'd be like, no, we worked on that, but <laughs> I feel like <laughs> that's mine. <laughs> it was always good. <laughs> Welcome to Social Kick. I'm Brian Lundquist. We got the full crew of Dr. John Mullen, Luke Paddington, and joining us from the road trip. So excited to hear about this. Mona McSherry, what's going on? Hey, how's it going? I'm currently um, broadcasting from Florence, Oregon. So halfway through my journey across the West Coast. Well, we got to hear about it because I was telling you before we came on that I've podcasted from the van before when we were interviewing Reagan Smith. But so now the the roles are reversed. Tell us about your trip. Yeah, it's uh, it's a big one. Um, it's kind of like the trip of a lifetime. Honestly, I started thinking about it maybe two years ago, um, and the idea started with just me and my dog and my Mini Cooper uh, traveling across America. And then I kind of last summer pitched the idea to my friends back home in Ireland and. Didn't think that they would say yes, but I thought I'd ask them anyway. And one of my friends, who's a primary school teacher, so she's taking the year off of work, said, yeah, sure, I'll come with you. Um, and so it kind of developed from there a year ago. We started looking into renting a van, and that's what we're doing now. And so we're basically doing van life for, we have 66 days at the van, and then we're going to do some skiing at the end. And I'm going to bring her back to Knoxville with me. Um, and then I'm going to go home for Christmas. So it's it's a long trip. Um, but we're, we're really enjoying it. I'm enjoying kind of just the flexibility of not having a schedule. We kind of just do what we want to do. Okay. I got a, I got a nerd out on a van question here though. Give me the specs of the van. What, what kind of van are you in? Are there like two beds in there? Is there a, is there a rooftop deck? No. It's got so four it's wheels, a, a steering wheel. Yeah, what else do you need, man? <laughs> it's a big car. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a, a 2018 Ram. Solid. We like rented it from Indie Campers. It has a pop up roof with a double bed up there, and then there's a double bed downstairs. So it technically fits four people. Um, it has like these two seats, and then the two front seats that flip around. It's got a shower, toilet, which we don't really use, an outdoor shower, a full kitchenette, because I love to cook. So we've been eating pretty well. Um, so it's, it's basically everything you need. Um, and we haven't had any arguments yet, so we're doing pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I don't think she did the build out, but she's putting your van to shame, B. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> hey, man, I didn't have uh, upstairs and downstairs beds, but I had the shower <laughs> and all that. So, and, and built. But, okay, favorite meal that you've cooked on the road then? Ooh, um, good question. We, I did like a gnocchi. I brought my, I got one of my NCAA gifts one year was like this cuisine art, like, toaster oven thing so i brought it with me so anytime we can plug into electricity i'm making like bake things so i made like a gnocchi chicken tomato mozzarella bake um that was pretty good uh, a lot of pasta dishes so i don't know if i could pick a favorite we've just been eating a lot of a lot of good food my friend drives and i do the cooking so it's a good trade-off I, w I want to double click on that for one second because it's something that i haven't heard somebody talk about in a really long time but uh the ncaa gifts I didn't even know they still did these. I remember yeah, getting like a, a, a DVD player and like a, maybe like a George Foreman grill or something. It's like a, it's like a gift that everybody gets for going to NCAAs, but no one ever talks about some random gift. Insanity. Like I, as an international too, like I'm just not, I mean, I don't think anyone's used to that, but I remember my first year for SECs, like the gifts were like a TV, um, like AirPods, a speaker, like all these big, I'm like, really what <laughs> i've never <laughs> been to I've, I've barely been to any meets where you get paid let alone you get gifts just for going i was like a tv really <laughs> it's crazy but i i mean it's it's a fun little thing it's exciting um to kind of you know when i when you go there and you get to go to the gift suite and pick out something so it's it's definitely a fun little additive all right well what's the worst swimming gift or thing that you've gotten it could be like when you're on the ward stand and it's like here you get to hold this really weird stuffed animal that we often see athletes with or like b said the random ncaa or conference gifts oh my gosh i don't know um luke did you have gifts back then in the 1800s or they were still trying to figure out what to do <laughs> 
Look what's north of the border. It's all just maple syrup up there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, here's a jacket. Here's another jacket. <laughs> <laughs> the SEC gifts are definitely better than the NCAA ones. To be fair, there's always like a selection. So you can pick out of like five. But I think I've always gotten pretty cool things. Um, I don't know if I could pick one that was honestly bad. Um, they're all pretty good. Nice. We got our per diem up from twenty one dollars to like thirty four dollars. That's that's the gift when you went to end to the college jumps. That was it. <laughs> so Mona, when I I had to wait until my career was over to do things like surfing and skiing and stuff, I was allowed to do because I you know get injured. And I just looked up Florence, Oregon, and I'm seeing sandboarding. Have we tried that? Are you doing this? What's that about? We we were looking that up today, and they're closed today. So if we hang around tomorrow, we're meant to be moving <laughs> on tomorrow, but we might stop by there in the morning and check it out um just to see because i'm definitely i'm definitely on that side like i've cut out skiing and all the dangerous sports to an extent um because of swimming but now i'm kind of i'm obviously not done swimming and i don't want to injure myself but i'm also on a break and i'm like you know what let's let's do these things i can't wait forever to have these things and you know if i if i get hurt we'll deal with that but um, I'm, I try and be relatively safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. What 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 kind of break it is? It's obviously a break from being in the pool and training, but is it a mental break and a physical break or just a complete physical uh, mental break? What are you doing? Um, I think more important, importantly, a mental break um, yeah. just to kind of be away from the rigidity of training. The type of person I am is like when I'm, when I'm an athlete, like when I'm in that zone, it's like what I eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm constantly thinking about how that's affecting swimming. And like, when I go to bed, I'm thinking, okay, I need to get sleep. And like, that's good for life too. But I feel like I'm always on and every, every choice I make and thing I do is like focused towards swimming. And that can be hard for, you know, 365 days of the year. Cause I feel like even when I do take a short break, I'm kind of like, okay, but I can't do this because yeah. it's going to affect me later down the road. So I'm really just trying to, kind of fully disconnect from that side and I, I know that when I get back in December January time I'm gonna have to like work really hard to be ready for February and like that's that's okay but I'm trying right now to not think about that and just let myself relax and I'm working out a little bit but kind of just for the fun of it more than like oh my gosh I need to stay in shape like I need to do this I need to do mm. that and I think it's it's so important and this seems like mm. the perfect time to do it after a pretty intense four-year cycle um I was like this is this is the time Mm -hmm. No, it makes total sense and seems like the perfect time to do it. And like I said, glad to hear you're, you're going to be swimming more after such an exciting Olympics. But when we were looking you up, it was like, is she retiring? Oh, she said she's going to retire. So so I guess was this a, a, a change of mind after um, Paris or or it's the online news? Don't believe anything you read type of thing. Um, I I only decided I was going to do my fifth year of college swimming or maybe half of it, I guess. Um, pretty like in my fourth year like up until then I was like no way I don't want my fifth year like four years is enough for me like I'm definitely done and then I got towards the end I was like I could do like one more but I knew I needed to take a break so it was kind of like pitched the idea of would I be able to take the fall semester off and still come back and the coaches were like yeah we'll we'll let you do that and like so glad that the team lets me do that as well and so I was like all right well I'll do one more year and I thought that that would be a nice way to take some pressure off the Olympics. Cause originally my, in my mind, I was like, 2024 is it. I'm done. I want to be done after that. Um, yeah. But I felt like that put a lot of pressure on swimming well at the Olympics, making the Olympics my last meet ever. And I was like, I don't want to do that. So I'll do at least one more year until 25. And now that I'm done with the Olympics, I'm like, well, maybe I'll do 25 <laughs> and then see how I'm feeling and maybe do 26. Um, right now it's, it's hard for me to be like, Oh, I'm definitely going to LA. Cause that's, another long four years yeah um but i think i'm just going to take it one year at a time and see how i feel um because i think i could be happy either way i could be happy leaving it but that's also really hard to do because it's been so much of my life for so long mm -hmm. that it would be hard to let go as well because i do love it um i have a lot of fun when i'm like in training and like competing and, and doing all the travel and it, it does it, it is a great lifestyle but i know eventually it will have to end <laughs> Yeah. Have, have you ever taken such a break before? And if so, how did you come back from it? And if you haven't taken a break before, have you thought about what's going to take 
when you go back to Tennessee? Are you like, I am not thinking about that. That's not my concern. That's coaches. Um, I've never taken this long of a break. I think the longest I've ever taken was I had mono back in 2019. And so I took about eight weeks off there, but I was sick. Mm. As for like just a break break. Uh, maybe max a month is the longest I've ever mm. taken, if even. Um, and so I, I don't really have anywhere to base this off of. Um, I know it's going to be a lot of hard work and commitment, but I'm kind of, I'm honestly excited and intrigued to see how far I can push my body in such a small amount of time to make it back. Um, mm. And I'm, I'm putting no pressure on myself to be where I was last year, because I think that would be a big ask. Um, and so I'm really just like the team this year, the Tennessee team is just unbelievable. And whatever I can try and contribute to that, I will um, when I get back. But I'm I'm kind of just excited just to see like how it goes. I'm definitely yeah. going to be in a lot of pain for the first couple of weeks. Yeah, but like you said, you're being fit and doing things on this road trip. And, you know, with Tennessee's performances on the women's side, I think, you know, your first year they were you guys were 10th, I think, a couple of years and then dropped down to eighth as a team here. I could see that being, you know, a fun incentive to, to get back and see if you can kind of keep the, the women's program on that right trajectory. Yeah, no, definitely. And I I'm keeping in touch a little bit with the team and we just had our training trip to Wilmington and like getting to hear from some people how that went. and like how strong the team sounds this year and how connected is, is really exciting. And I think part of me is sad that I'm not there to be in that right now, but I mean, you can't have everything. And so um, I know that this is the best decision for me to be away right now, but I am excited to, to get back to them and see what I can do for the team. Yeah. And you know, two runner ups and the hundred breasts, maybe like you said, no expectations on yourself, but maybe that, first place in the hundred breast <laughs> look I'm, I'm definitely going for it i think <laughs> it's hard not yeah to gotta be gotta be right driving. yeah um, so we'll just see what happens uh, mona do you do you enjoy i can't tell if you love short course or if you love long course after what the, after the hundred breast final it's like dang that first uh, that second 25 you were accelerating do you enjoy long course over short course or they're both you love both um i think i prefer long course and before mm. going to Tennessee, I would have said I prefer short course because coming from where I used to train in Ireland, I trained primarily in a 25 meter pool. Maybe yeah. one time a week I would do long course training, um, but there just was no access. I mean, the closest long course pool to me was two and a half hours away. So oh. it's it's a lot of work. Um, and so I thought I loved short course more and I do like the quick over and back, but I think I'm more suited to long course. Um, and once I kind of get into that sort of training, I definitely prefer the swimming more so than I think my my underwaters and my walls and, and starts could do with, uh, maybe a little bit more work um, to be better at short course, I would say. Mona, are there any outdoor pools in Ireland? Oh, um, there definitely is a few, but not that people would use. I, I mean... Maybe open water swimmers would use them, but none that I know of that like normal swimmers would use. We really don't have the weather for that. <laughs> when was the first time you swam in an outdoor pool? Do you remember? Um, maybe on a training trip to Lanzarote or something when I was maybe 15, 14 or 15. I was just thinking for, for, for the Irish, not something that they would necessarily, um, A, like be, be acclimatized to, um, but mm -hmm. probably doesn't exist much with the weather. No, yeah. yeah, we're, we definitely don't do any outdoor. That's why it's, it's so fun. I mean, normally the Irish team will go away during kind of January time right after Christmas because it's, it's pretty depressing in Ireland uh, during that time. The weather is pretty gray and rainy and it's just kind of hard to get yourself going. So it's nice to take a week's break and go to Tenerife for something and swim outside and get some sun. So that's normally kind of would be embedded into the training program for us back in Ireland. All right, but let's, let's go to Paris. You, you affected the three of us immensely. It was, it was one of the shining moments of, of a long time of, of any athlete swimming. So congrats on that. It really moved us. And for what it meant to you as a, as a person, as a human, and obviously to Ireland, could you could you explain a little bit more to us what that meant for Ireland? I mean, we we read the stats first, medal since this, and you and Dan did that. But 
explain to us. I didn't know you long coast pulled two and a half hours away. That's crazy. Like, explain to what I really meant to the people of Ireland and Irish swimming, what you and Dan managed to do. You I especially. Think it, yeah. yeah, I think it just shows um, where we can be and athletes younger. Like, what I strive to do is to kind of be the stepping stone of what younger athletes can see their, themselves then doing. Um, and I think for me, the hardest thing when I was growing up competing at Europeans um, and World Juniors and then moving into the senior stage was – and I still sometimes feel this is I always feel like um, I'm kind of just there to compete. And because I'm from a smaller country and with a smaller team, it's kind of hard to visualize myself being one of the top competitors and like being someone that other people are looking and going, Oh, she's like, she is tough to race. And like, she's a big competitor. I think I always feel like I'm kind of on the outside. Um, and I, I think that's just in part because it's hard to see yourself in a place where you may not growing up have seen others before you. And so I'm, I'm trying to kind of be someone that the younger children can look up to and see, okay, well, this is what swimming can get you. And like, maybe I'm not training in a 50 meter pool. Um, maybe I don't have the best facilities. I mean, I trained in a small five lane, 25 meter pool up until I was 20 and moved to college in Tennessee. Um, and that's where all my foundations were built and it wasn't at the fanciest center with the you know most well-equipped coaches like me and my uh coach grace at the time it was our first time for both of us she'd never coached someone at my level i'd never been at that level i'd never seen anyone really at that level um and so i think it just shows the way that swimming is going even having you know myself winning a medal and then having ellen walsh in a final and danielle hill in a semifinal for women in sport just shows how much we're moving forward. Um, like at the last Olympics, I made a final and that was kind of, you know, that, that was it. Like, and so we're mm. really pushing the the line forward and it's, it's just so exciting. And I think that <clears throat> means a lot for, for Irish swimming. When I was 14, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, a little Island in the Caribbean. And, um, you know, you've got some, you got to swim up in Trinidad and Tennessee now, actually. And when I was growing up and I was 14 years old, I made my first national team. And it was 1988. Yes, 1988. And Anthony Nesty comes back because he was born in Trinidad. And Anthony Nesty shows up with his gold medal. And we got to meet Anthony. And for me to see that somebody from my island with those resources could win a gold medal against the great Matt Biondi, it, it blew my mind and it, it, it kept me swimming and, and it encouraged me and people after me to end up winning. I didn't win medals, but People are after me won medals and bronze medals from Trinidad. Um, so I, I can relate to what you're saying. And um, But, uh, you know, the opportunities to excel came from the hard work, but also the facilities and the coaching outside of the country as well. You know, how many of the athletes, uh, you know, describe Ireland and the training, the facilities, the coaches. Are you still um, reliant on external re resources or are we improving the national training centers in Ireland, et cetera? To get you to get the next generation after you, after Daniel Hill and Ellen Walsh. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we do have some really good national centers. I know for me, I got I always knew that I wanted to go to America and train there because yeah. I just felt like that would be a better like I love the in, intense racing environment that you get from being there and kind of the distraction that short course yards gives you for half of the year. So you're not constantly yeah. thinking about long course meters. And for any younger athletes that do talk to me, I'm like, if you get an opportunity to go to America and you think you won't miss home like that much, like I think mm -hmm. then that like you should definitely take that and run with it. But I think where we're missing in Ireland is the support maybe at the lower level when children are still, when kids are still in school. Um, and cause we have a pretty big dropout rate for teenagers um, that mm -hmm. they just kind of decide at that time that they're like, I'm done. And, you know, that can be a hard time to move to a big national center. We can't have everyone in the country moving to Dublin or moving to Limerick. And so I think that, you know, if, if we could get a little bit more support for home programs um, and children to stay in sport at that point longer to make it through to college, and then you can decide, okay, well, I'd like to go to Dublin and train there at the national center facilities or train in Limerick at the national center facilities when you go to college or go to England or America. But I think where we're kind of lacking a little bit of support is that age group before they even get mm -hmm. to college. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the hardest part about Ireland is that you, you see people drop off too early 
Um, Cause that can be a hard time. I mean, you've got, you know, your friends and everyone else that are deciding that they now want to go out on the weekends and you're thinking, well, I can't really do that. And so that's kind of when people decide, no, this is not for me. Um, and so mm-hmm. I think that's where we kind of need more support. We have so much in the centers, but it's kids are not even surviving that long to get to the centers. Hey, are you famous? <laughs> in Ireland? Yeah, for real. Yeah. Yeah. And like how famous uh, are you? Um, Sign my face. Yeah. <laughs> definitely in my i mean my hometown is 800 ish people um it's so it's like everyone knows me there i walk into the shop and it's yeah and then where i went to school and where i trained is the town like a couple of towns over and obviously everyone knows me there but i think it's it's definitely gone wider than that now and i do like when i went home for two weeks after the olympics um i went to a morgan wallen concert in Dublin, and I had someone before he came on and started singing. I had someone tap me on the back of my shoulder and went, "Hey, are you Mona? Can we get a picture?" And I, that's so surreal to me because, like, I, I don't know that that just seems crazy. Uh, but yeah, I, I think my face is definitely recognized a lot more now, maybe than it used to be, um, which is it's fun. But I definitely for I like being in Tennessee because I don't think I could deal with that on a daily basis. Like it's, it's nice to go home and have everyone be really excited and so supportive. I mean, like so much support from my hometown. I think that's the fun thing about being there. But if I had to train there daily and deal with that daily, I would, I would struggle. I I don't love the constant praise. I like to just kind of hide away. (laughs) Well, it doesn't surprise me uh, to hear that because my experience in Paris was, I remember being stricken at the pool whenever uh, there was an Irish swimmer there. I I forget what evening it was, to be honest, but there was one of the nights um, that was there toward the end of the swimming sessions. I remember there being a moment where there were just so many Irish flags out. I think it was probably for one of Dan's races, Um, but there was a huge show out. And I think out of any country, truly, maybe besides the host nation, I saw more people out carrying and like wrapped in the Irish flag than any other country. And like, I went to men's cycling and watched the mixed team triathlon. Like there was a wide representation of countries, but like, if I were just take a survey of like my observation in Paris, Ireland was the one that stood out. And I remember uh, speaking to this woman on the street who was draped in a flag and she was leaving athletics as I was, you know, leaving or heading to another um, sporting venue. And we talked just a bit about like, hey, what are you doing here? You know, are you, do you, do you know an athlete or, you know, are you just here as a fan? And she said, no, I just like love sport and I'm here to support Ireland. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. So it doesn't shock me to hear like, hey, they love their sports. They love their athletes. And, you know, you're, uh, you're going to be super famous, uh, you know, for the rest of your life. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're a small but mighty nation and I think everyone loves to rally behind a uh, sport and it's great. What I would love to see is this support, maybe not in an Olympic year, you know, for, yeah. for swimming on, on the next three years. And then again at the Olympics, um, cause sometimes you do have a little bit of a fall off, but, um, it was so exciting. I mean, the comparison between Tokyo and, um, Paris, just unbelievable experience having family and friends. And, um, I, I mean, I had, I felt like I had an army of people there to support just me. And then you add on the extra people that don't know me, but we're also just there and wanted to see it was just, uh, it, it, it really made it like, that was the best part is to be able to kind of walk out of the pool and run up to all my family members and, and have them have a great time too. I think like the, the whole McSharry clan just <laughs> had a great time. <laughs> Well, as we've determined, you're ultra famous in Ireland. And with that, I'm sure you are going to be talking more with the swimming community there. I'm sure you probably are already. So what advice would you give like, you know, an age group swimmer? What advice would you give that teenage swimmer that's not quite at the the training centers like you were mentioned earlier? And what advice would you maybe give someone that is at that training center now and trying to figure out what how to navigate and how to keep keep moving along? Yeah, I think it's really important to be setting goals constantly and not only, I mean, like I, I think I said it in a couple of interviews that like 2024 and meddling was a goal that I had set out maybe eight or nine years before the games, you know? So it was constantly in the back of my mind, but then also creating those smaller goals, 
not only in the pool and every day for your training, but also when you're going to competitions and and so that you have all these different areas where you can pull from of like, okay, but I did this today, even though my swim wasn't the best, I like my underwater was really good so that you're not constantly beating yourself down when you feel like you're going through a period that is maybe a little bit tougher, that you can focus on some positives that you have going on. And then I think just really like looking at all the things that swimming gives you and they're like or any sports for that matter I mean like there's so many benefits like I love being able to just push myself and see how I can get better and how other people can help me get better all my best friends I have like found through swimming and I'm gonna have them for a lifetime I mean I wouldn't be on this road trip with my best friend now if it wasn't for swimming I met her in the club like I think that you need to just kind of if you're going through a harder time and you feel like maybe this is the end for me like go back to why you started the sport or started swimming and look at all the things that it gives you and then also don't be afraid to like shake things up or or try something new um if if you feel like that's what you need mona you you brought this on yourself you did two things in paris that caused this hysteria um i'm going to talk i'm going to describe the race i'm going to describe how you were first of all you do a best time in semis people don't do best times at the olympics you do a best time you're in lane five and then how you swam that race, it was, I can't imagine being your parents because it was a nightmare. How you how you came up from behind, second at the 50, for those who um, didn't don't remember the race, second at the 50, you come back at them, you just out, almost could get gold. You out-touched two people by 0 0.01 for the bronze. So how you ra raced that race was incredible. But then your raw, honest, emotional interviews and reactions after on the podium, the interviews, was so endearing and so so raw. We all related to that. Tell us something about that that evening that we don't know, that we didn't see, that we didn't feel. Um, gosh. Um, let me think back through it. Um, I think <laughs> I I was. I mean, like anyone would be. I, like I was so nervous going into it, and I think everyone in the prep area could see that. Um, I, I remember like sometimes I would come in and I would be so like excited and bubbly and happy and I was really trying to work on that and then I remember like coming in for this and I was definitely a little bit more quiet and our physio was like I, I didn't want to talk to you because I felt like you were just in the zone and um but I think um I mean the race was definitely not a perfect race one of my goggles filled up which I know that like everyone knows because I talked about it in the interview but um I think there was that moment where I was kind of like no 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 we're not we're not letting this go like this is like and I that's probably why I was second at the first 50 is because I kind of overswam that first 50 a little bit just being like let's go we gotta go <laughs> <laughs> it's now or never and so it definitely burned a lot but I think just like I guess that was the internal talk to myself while I was racing I was like you've got to push you've got to push you hurt you got to go you got to go and I think like I've had a couple of races even in the last year where I have been on the other side of that touch out where I've been fourth or fifth um mm -hmm. and I, I kind of may have gave up because it wasn't a perfect race or I could see people kind of passing me by and I felt like those moments were all a build up for this and really just being mm -hmm. able to push um and just jab into the wall um as mm -hmm. fast as I could yeah, you had Tang next to you going out like a rocket. So when you are like, this is time, let's go, let's go, then you're 0. 0.6 behind and not knowing you're in second at the time, probably, right? Um, but just know that she's ahead of you. And then I think you were next to Tatiana, too, who you're ahead of and probably knew you would be ahead of her at the 50 off of her strategy, typically. Was there any concern, though, with how fast Tang was, uh, how much further ahead she was? Yeah, it's... It, it's hard with breaststroke because I feel like sometimes my mind plays tricks on me. Like sometimes someone is behind you, but the way that they're throwing their hands forward sure. is creating a slack. So I, I was like, yeah, exactly. Like, like this. <laughs> yeah. um, and because of my goggle, I couldn't see anything that was going on on that side. So I, I had no idea what was going on there. And I was like, well, she's probably going fast because she's been having an exceptional meet. Um, yeah. And then I could see Tang and I was like, all right, we've got to like, we've got to catch her like, and I knew that she had kind of been dying at the end of her races. And so, and I like, that's what I've been working on is my back end speed. And like, I knew that I would be able to, I was like, right, let's just try, let's go 34. You've done so many 34s in practice. You've done a 34, 30, like, let's like catch her. And so that's kind of what was going on in my head is 
I didn't know exactly where she was, but she was definitely close. And I knew I was just trying my best to catch her. But like Luke said, you want a best time in this pool, the slowest pool ever invented, <laughs> especially for breaststroke, where men are going three seconds slower than the world record. Women are way off the world record. You want a best time. So do you have like a 103 in you in a different pool? <laughs> you know, it's so funny because talking to my sports psych uh, before, like just in the past year and like even to Matt and like talking about this race and what it would take to win it i'm like i've got to go 104 uh like that there's no way i'm getting on the podium unless i go 104 um yeah. and so i was kind of like in my mind prepared for that and then we did the the set i guess the heat you know the heat can be slow you never know people yeah. just kind of getting into it um and then with how the semis went i was like okay maybe maybe it's not going to be a 104 like maybe it's like we don't know um and so it's kind of funny to look back at those thoughts because I still truly believe that I can go 104 based on just the way I was training and the way I would feel swimming. Um, I just feel like that's, that's in me, um, at some point. And so I guess we'll have to see, but it was, it was really fun to be part of because it's a pretty small percentage of people that get to, um, get to PB. So I'm excited to be a part of that basically. Hey everybody, quick pause to say thank you for watching and listening to social kick if you like this episode, give it a like. And if you like what we're all about, consider giving us a follow or subscribe on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, at Social Kick Swim. You know what to do. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. And we'll keep telling all the stories about swimming. Cheers. You talked about knowing you could have gone 104. Was there a set? Like, was there a, a broken 100 you did a couple of weeks out? Or, or was there, like, you said, you know, you could do 34s. Were you doing a, a lot of sets and you're nailing the back end 50s and going 34s? Was that a set that you and Matt said, see, you got in you, you you're ready? Or, or you just knew it from your training? Was there one um, set that gave you a pace? Yeah. I don't think there was one set, but there was definitely, we did a couple of um, stand up swims and I'm I'm not the fastest. I can be fast, but I'm not like lights out in training. I kind of pull it together at race two. But I think like we did a couple of stands up, stand ups at the end of long weeks on a Saturday and I would be going like 106 lows, um, which I like, I was like, this is kind of nice because it didn't feel that hard. Like it felt easy. And then like at that point I'd only gone a 105 twice. And so I was thinking this is, this is nice that I'm able to just in the middle of a training block go 106s. And then we had done so many sessions where you'd be doing 50 repeats on pretty short rest, maybe 10 seconds or so. And I'd be doing like 34s, like 34s just were like so comfortable for me that I felt like I could go out um, and then just be able to bring it back 34. Like, and maybe that going out speed wouldn't be as fast, but the 34, like that just was so consistent. And so that kind of gave me a lot of confidence in my abilities when taper comes um, and rest comes that, and even just a race environment that I would be able to be pull it out of the bag. What's your breaststroking technique superpower? We, we, we see your stroke and, you know, you're powerful. You get almost like your lower body gets out like a Kevin Cordes over the water for your recovery. Uh, you got good turnover and strength. What, what do you consider to be your 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 strength in breaststroke? Uh, I think my legs, my kick. Really? Yeah. Um, I yeah, like your... even as a child, I just always feel like the kick was always the power for me. Um, mm -hmm. And I I definitely just like have good. I think I've grown my full body connection when swimming breaststroke since I've been at Tennessee. Like we've kind of broken it down to like pretty small pieces and then built it back up and so I feel like now I'm utilizing my kick at the best time when I'm in a good like streamlined position and I'm surging forward but I definitely think if you were to pull it all apart the most important or influential piece is definitely just the power that I get from my kick. Is it a Zach Stubbly Cook wide? Is it Shimanovich narrow? Is it just really good timing of your pull? What how would you describe it? I would say it's wider. Um, yeah. I, I got I I think Matt asked me before if I wanted to make it narrower and I said no I don't want to do it. <laughs> like, um, I think my kick is good wide <laughs> that was like way back maybe freshman year um, but I I think um, it's it's definitely wider and I have a really good like whip at the end of it um, yeah. uh, and a lot of endurance like I can kick for quite a long time um, without 
like I would say my breaststroke kick is nearly as fast as my flutter kick and I have a pretty good flutter kick too um but I can I can move pretty fast with breaststroke kick do you feel like that's something that you just naturally have or that the training or dry land or any other components have you know fostered it or helped out even further I think naturally I just have a really good breaststroke kick and kick in general like even when I think back to like training at home in Ireland like I used to love kick sets and felt like I just have really good endurance for kicking um and just always had a good breaststroke kick probably ask my club coach and she'd be like no we worked on that but I feel like (laughs) that's mine it was always good (laughs) um and like I love strength and conditioning so I've I've definitely made my legs more powerful over the last uh 10 maybe less than 10 years but eight years or so um and so that definitely helps what about your fittest family in ireland how's their breaststroke kick i was wondering if you were gonna bring that up (laughs) have to yeah i mean if if well if you watch that i don't think any americans would have watched that but um all the irish would know like my my whole family is pretty pretty strong pretty um fit and stubborn i would say too and we like to win um and so i think like you can kind of see that on the show then too like my my brother is like built like an ox and he used to swim too but he's just like jacked and so is my dad and and my mom is just also really fit we're just uh yeah we're a fit family all right 450s kick when you're you know not on a road trip but in your prime 450s kick on a minute long course what are you going with best average breaststroke or freestyle breaststroke breaststroke um long course I want to say best average on a minute. Maybe I want to say I can hit maybe like a 40. Nice. Yeah. That's faster than Luke's going in 53. So uh, don't be, <laughs> don't be ashamed exactly. with that. 40, 42. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right, good, might very text good. me and be like, absolutely not. Mona. <laughs> 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 I th- I, I'm pretty confident I can do that though. <laughs> And, uh, you know, when we're looking at, um, like I said, you're you're on the road trip, getting back to Tennessee, training for a few months there. Are there, like I said, you're just not having expectations with it, but is part of you kind of excited just to see what you can go? Like, all right, like you said, I haven't had this long break. Let's just rip it and see what happens. Yeah, definitely. I think like I, there's obviously certain days where I wake up and I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to like, I've got to move. Like I, I'm losing my body. Like it's, it. but we're we're doing so much and we're being quite active and I think like it it is it's going to be really fun just to see how quickly I can turn it around and I mean like Mm -hmm. um I've I've got nothing to lose so I'm just going to try my best um and and see see what I can do and I'm I'm definitely not afraid of hard work and I do love like when when I'm in the grind phase I can grind and so I'm I'm excited to just kind of get into that and go when the time is right and then we did have you know, many audience questions uh, at Social Kick Swim. For those that follow us, we often ask our guests for for questions. But one specific one is on point with this, and it's just: Can you share some tips for for breaststrokers? Kick, they get tired and they have a hard time. It sounds like with their endurance with it. And that was from I don't even know how to say this. Omar Canugas uh, was their handle on Instagram. So thanks for the question. Um, I I feel like I feel like this is, but like it's kind of you got to just build it up. I know that that like seems like a really simple answer but I mean if you're if your kick is getting tired then it sounds like you got to do more kick <laughs> like yeah um and kind of just try and like train it up and I think even like going outside of uh the pool and doing maybe more um endurance stuff in the weight room too like not necessarily lifting heavy weights but maybe moving less weight but for longer just to try and kind of get more of the the endurance training going and and see if that can that can help yeah Did you hear that, I, I know, yeah i know i'm, I'm my breaststroke has not improved since i was eight years old so there you go <laughs> <laughs> gotta do it Luke. i promise there's i promise still time. <laughs> there's still time i'm on a break okay i'm this is my 20 year break but it's okay <laughs> 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 um, another audience question, uh, Sophia Pal09 says, and it's interesting, uh, was was breaststroke always your main event? I know you accomplished 100 IMO, 
your freestyle's pretty damn fast. Was was it do you always were a breaststroker or did you actually swim like us? Um <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I kind of did quite a bit growing up, which I think is awesome because it was a time when my breaststroke was pretty slow and it was nice to be able to just be good at other things like freestyle and I am. My backstroke is pretty brutal. It always has been. Um, and I don't know if that's really going to change, but I, I was always a breaststroker. I think I was always pretty good at that one. And so that kind of became my main stroke quickly, but I always tried to keep in touch with I am and freestyle as well. So with your I am and freestyle, um, you have this little break, getting back in, assuming breaststrokes and, and free are going to be the main events, uh, SECs and all that. Then training for another year. Are, is there any thought of trying some different events, uh, you know, World Cups and other events after your collegiate career? I mean, that would be a lot of fun. Um, I think like, especially short course, like the 100 I am, oh, that's, that's a lightning fast but fun events like I, I would love I, I was gutted that I couldn't do this road trip and then also go to world short course but you can't have everything so uh because world short course is always a lot of fun um but yeah I mean I think like the 50 freestyle 50 fly like um maybe 100 freestyle I definitely have to do some more training for that even if especially if it was long course but um, I think it's fun to do other things and maybe take a break from breaststroke because it has been the focus for so long. So that would definitely be a fun thing to do. You, what, what advice do you have for people who come second at a national championship a couple of times who, on, on the other side, who who just got beat for a medal by 0 0.01? You know, do, in swimming, it's such a cutthroat thing. It's so short and and um, the, the, the margins of, of victory and being famous and not right and you know we require mental breaks and sports psychiatrists to help us and stuff what's your commentary on that and how brutal our sport can be with the highs and the lows over 0 0.01 you know um it's it's really tough um and it's i i don't think it gets easier i mean i i remember after world long course in february being yeah. extremely upset and down um just because of the results of that meet, especially going in, in second. And I mean, like the psych sheet that never tells you what's actually going to happen at a meet, but mm -hmm. um, going in second and then having the first place person DQ'd was, it was gutting, gutting then not to be um, on the podium. But I think like looking at swimming or any sport as not only for the victories or the competitions, but then also all of the other stuff. I mean, I've tried um, two years ago, I really had to reframe kind of how I look at swimming and um, making sure that my priority was how much I enjoy the 90%, which is the training and the getting better and like not necessarily put everything into the 1%, which is what your result is going to be because sometimes that's out of your control um you know it it doesn't always go right training out doesn't always go right uh you can't control what other people are going to do um you could have three other people that just swim lights out and you also swam lights out but they were better and so i think like trying to focus on the the other half of being an athlete which is just the day-to-day -day of getting to do something pretty cool i mean you wake up in the morning and you get to go train and have fun and be you know an elite athlete which is pretty cool can take a nap eat loads of food train again like get loads of sleep like we we live a really good lifestyle and i think people yeah. forget that sometimes like it's really hard it's a tough life but um it's also like there's so many great things about it and i think sometimes everyone gets caught up in well i'm a failure because i'm fourth or i'm a failure because i'm second and you're not as long as you tried your hardest and you know, you, you did everything you could do. And once you've done that, there's really nothing more. Um, and so it, it's still, even though I try and think like that and look at things like that, there's definitely a, a period where you're going to grieve a little bit because you do put so much into it, but then knowing yeah. that there's going to be more and no one around you is saying, Oh, well, you're no one that cares about you around you is saying, Oh, well, you're a failure. And everything you did is like for nothing now, like, and I know sometimes we like to think like that, but really everyone is supporting you and just watching how much you're growing and being amazing. And so I think it's important just to remember those things. Um, and that's what I kind of try and tell myself whenever I've had 
you know, races maybe that didn't go my way. Like even I remember at, um, when I came second at NCAAs, that was really tough. Um, mm-hmm. at the time I was kind of like, well, this is my last chance at a, um, a national championship and, uh, it, it didn't really go the way I wanted. Um, and, but then having so many teammates around me and knowing that I still had a relay to do and like, I had to, you know, pull myself yeah. back together for this fun relay and like everyone around me helped me and they all yeah. could see and understood why I was so upset. Um, but we're also like, Mona, you're amazing. You just got second at NCAA. It's like, you just did this for the team. Like, come on, you're good. Um, and, and so that was really helpful too. And so kind of just leaning on the people around you, I think is important. I mean, a bronze medal at the Olympic games was no surprise. Anybody who knew swimming and knew who you, who you are and who you were and what you've achieved. So it was fantastic. But, um, I bet when you go back to Ireland, you got some pretty cool gifts and you got some really strange sponsors. I want to show you something. For those at home are doing the podcast, this I'm, looks going to do show and tell time. All right, right just again. a warning. So my last name is Paddington, and there's a really good horse farm in Ireland called Coolmore Farms. It's about three hours south of Silgo, and they have this hat called Paddington. And I saw it, and I really liked it, and I just emailed them, and the nice, kind people at Coolmore Farms sent this to me. Right, <laughs> and they had named a horse after me because I'm so famous, obviously. <laughs> but <That's awesome>. <laughs> but re- really nice people in Ireland. But my question around this is: Did you get any cool gifts or, or honors from Ireland? And second of all, were there any strange requests for sponsors or like, hey, would you promote our X or socks? I don't know. Yeah. Um. Honestly, the biggest gifts I got were the two homecomings. And I know that that's not like necessarily a, a thing that I'm getting, but the time and effort put into both of them. I mean, like I basically have two, two towns that want to claim me, which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, and both of them went pretty uh, overboard trying to like organize like pretty cool events. And so th- those were definitely the best gifts because it was just so nice to yeah. see everyone show out and I mean I love flowers and I got a lot of flowers I think there was like maybe 10 bouquets in the house uh and I I I then left to go back to America and I was like all right mom enjoy the flowers um (laughs) but as far as like weird things go I didn't get anything super crazy um I had one person that wanted to rename their coffee brand like a specific coffee brand after me that was and I said, yeah, sure. That's awesome. Like my, my parents drink that specific coffee. And so that was okay, really yeah. nice. And then I just got, um, <clears throat> a couple of beautiful, like crystal trophies, um, as well. And so people just like the support was unbelievable. I honestly mm-hmm. wasn't asked to sponsor or to like promote anything super crazy, which I guess is good. <laughs> 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 or maybe I missed it. I kind of disconnected from my yeah. Instagram messages. It just became too much for me. I was like, I can't. Uh, yeah. So people might have tried to reach out, and I just went absolutely not. I'm sorry, <laughs> too much. I think you get um, a horse named after you. Come on, come on, cool, more get a horse. <laughs> I know that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> well, Mona, we have some rapid fire. That's our gift to you. But the Mona McSherry coffee must have a strong kick. I got to throw that great <laughs> little uh, one in there. Okay. All right. So rapid fire. What's the hardest race in swimming? Two fly. Never done it, but two fly. <laughs> Olympic gold or world record? Olympic gold. All right. Time for some honesty. Have you ever had a one hand touch at a meet and not been DQ'd? No. All right. Have you ever had two dolphin kicks on your pullout? At a no. Meet? <laughs> Who's weirder, breaststrokers or distance swimmers? Settle the score. Distance swimmers. <laughs> Speaking of distance swimmers, we had an audience question Who would win at 200 breast, you or Dan Whiffen? Oh my gosh, me. <laughs> By how much? What's Dan going in the 200 press? Does he break three minutes? Is he finishing it? <laughs> I don't know. You tell us. <laughs> uh, I I think he's not even finishing it, to be honest. <laughs> I've never seen him some breaststroke. <laughs> there, enough said. All right. In your opinion, who's the best female breaststroker of all time? All time. Wow. <sighs> The first person coming to mind right now is Tatiana, just because I think she did amazing in both the 100 and the 200. So I'll just go with that. There you go. Hey, that's a good choice. No doubt about it. What's the most annoying thing a teammate can do in practice? 
skip something. <laughs> All right. Then last one here before you get back on your road trip. Are you doing any social kick on your road trip? And how much social kick do you do at Tennessee? Um, no social kick on my trip as I have not found a pool yet, but, um, we do a pretty decent amount of social kick once we're done with our staff. Good. Good. It's nice. Perfect. Love to hear it. All right, Mona. Well, that's all we have for you. You enjoy the rest of your road trip. Be safe and enjoy your cruise across America. Thank you so much for having me. All right, everyone. That's this episode of Social Kick. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it. And be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick. And you can find all of our content on our website at thesocialkick.com.